Hello and welcome. I'm Ashwin Ahmed and I'm in conversation with veteran journalist Terry Milevsky. The topic we will be discussing today is an explosive one. The report is called Khalistan, a project of Pakistan. Terry, first of all, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. So, you know, you've been reporting on the subject for many years. Now, what made you come to the conclusion that Khalistan is a project of Pakistan? Well, I, it's because I stumbled over the years. I've been covering this story for 35 years, ever since I was sent to Ireland to cover the bombing of Air India in June of 1985 as a young reporter. And I always wondered, well, you know, who, who would do this? Why would they do this? And it bothered me for years. And then I noticed something that was a, a real mismatch uh, more recently. I noticed that, uh, firstly, the people who are now organizing a uh, referendum on Sikh independence uh, are uh, devoted to the cause of Pakistan. Uh, they swear undying loyalty to Pakistan. Uh, at the same time that Sikhs uh, in uh, Pakistani Punjab uh, are, are still, I mean, for them, partition is not over, it seems. Uh, they still right. are victims of discrimination, forced conversions to Islam, uh, attacks on Gurdwaras. They're still being driven out, just as they were in 1947, only in much greater numbers. Uh, right. And so th this was a complete mismatch. Here we have uh, the Sikhs in Pakistan being discriminated against and being driven out into India. And we have the Sikhs who lead the independence movement, or say they do, uh, swearing undying loyalty to their friends in Pakistan. Well, to put it mildly, this didn't add up. Uh, so I, I started to look into this uh, more closely and to start and right. uh, uh, to take a, a better look at the historical record. I mean, covering this, as you can imagine, for uh, I'm, I'm a news reporter for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or I was until I retired for 40 years. And, and uh, you know, so my, my limit would be two and a half minutes and about half a dozen times, maybe a dozen at the most, I was allowed to do a, more, a longer documentary piece, but I never really took, the, took a look at the big picture. Now I have the leisure to do that. So I did. Terry, in what way does Pakistan support the Khalistani movement? I'm talking more specifically about the secessionist group Seeks for Justice, which is allegedly funded by the ISI. Well, I, I can't prove that. I don't know. I think they've got their own sources of funding in the West uh, as well, or instead of in Pakistani funding. I've never stumbled on much evidence that the flow of money comes from Pakistan to the secessionist movement, uh, ra rather the reverse. Uh, the uh, Sikh communities, immigrant communities in the West, in the UK, in the US, in Canada, uh, they're, they're, they've been very successful. They are hardworking, taxpaying citizens, and uh, they do very well. And they can they can afford to fund that small minority that is interested in an independent Khalistan uh, has no tr trouble finding money. What Pakistan does for them, of course, is absolutely crucial, and that is. A safe haven. You're not, right. you know, you, you, you can't uh, 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 amass weapons uh, for uh, uh, or explosives to attack Indian targets inside Indian Punjab and last very long. You're not free to operate if that's what you have in mind. Uh, in Pakistan, however, you can. And the classic example uh, would be the author, as it turned out the mastermind, if you will, of the Air India bombing of 1985 that we just mentioned, uh, Talvinda Singh Parma, uh, who, uh, when he fled Canada after the bombing, went, of course, to Pakistan, where he had safe haven up until he s snuck across the border uh, and was caught uh, by the Punjab police and killed uh, in 1992. Uh, so uh, Pakistan provides principally a refuge uh, logistics, uh, they can find accommodation, medical care, uh, and a toleration from officialdom uh, in a way that they can't elsewhere. Terry, where do you see the Khalistani movement today? Do you see a resurgence of this movement now? Uh, I think perhaps the reverse. Uh, let me explain that. Um, 
the Khalistan movement may be nearing the end of a road. And I say that because they have shot themselves in the foot by fomenting this uh, referendum. Uh, I right. mean, let, let, let's let's be honest. This isn't a referendum that's intended to say, you know, let, let's settle this question among all the Sikhs uh, in the world and see uh, what engage the level of support for an independent state. No, this is explicitly aimed at supporters of independence. They're the ones who are supposed to come out and vote to end, and I'm quoting now from the literature of, of Seats for Justice, the illegal occupation of Punjab by India, but, but not, by the way, Pakistan's occupation of the rest of Punjab. They don't mention that. That's okay. In fact, one of the revealing things that I hit upon during the research for this latest article was the maps of the supposed Khalistan that are prepared and distributed by Sikhs for Justice and the, the, the man splinter group of, of the uh, Shiramani Akali Dal, um, which show uh, a very expansive map of Khalistan uh, encompassing several Indian states and including New Delhi, by the way. Um, uh, but, 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 but if you look to the west of the border, it stops at Pakistan. None of the traditional Sikh lands in Pakistan are being claimed by Sikhs for justice. Not Lahore, where Ranjit Singh ran a Sikh empire 200 years ago. Not Nankana Sahib, the birthplace of Guru Nanak, the first Sikh guru. Well, th these are places that, of course, are absolutely central to Sikh history and culture, but they're not claiming them because they don't want to forfeit Pakistani support. And this goes back to the question that you asked earlier about what Pakistan is doing. What Pakistan is doing is serving its own interest, not the Khalistanis' right. interest. They're serving their own interest in, firstly, bleeding India, making life hard for India by fomenting uh, activities by proxies, whether they be Islamist or Sikh uh, within India. Secondly, they want a strategic buffer between India and Pakistan. Uh, the, uh, and, and that they want principally because of re, uh, out of revenge for the 1970 war and the loss of Bangladesh. Uh, we don't have to go into all that history, but certainly it was a humiliation for Pakistan to lose East Pakistan, yes. to see it become Bangladesh in that war with India in 71. Uh, and they wanted revenge for that. And finally, they wanted to, if they were, were to get an independent Khalistan, of course, that would cut off India's land access to Kashmir. So all of the so it, it all makes perfect sense from from Pakistan's point of view, but not none of these uh, 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 is really being achieved. What they're uh, the only thing that Pakistan is really achieving is is the first thing, bleeding India, uh, setting up an independent state. I don't think they think that's realistic, and uh, and it isn't. Terry, I want to shift the focus slightly to the West. Why have Western countries, I'm talking specifically Canada, UK, etc., why have they been so ambivalent all these years? Uh, why have suspected uh, Khalistani terrorists escaped censure? It's a very good question, uh, I, I, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to be very blunt in my answer. And that is they've been blind and soft. Uh, they have been, uh, for, in Canada, for example, uh, with very little experience of terrorism uh, and uh, not really understanding what all of this fuss on the other side of the world was all about, uh, Canadian politicians would notice that uh, Sikh immigrants in Canada, some of them were very politically active. Uh, they would come to you at your nomination meeting and say, look, uh, I've got 10,000 votes in the bag voting as a bloc if you sing my Khalistani song. And it sounded like a nice song, independence. Who could be against independence and sovereignty? And, oh, it sounds like these Indians are terrible people and they've, they've done terrible things. Uh, and so they would go along until they hit a wall and something happens. And in Canada's case, of course, the Air India bombing happened. Mostly Canadians of Indian descent, including dozens of Sikhs, by the way, were, were exterminated in that terrorist attack. So, uh, so in, in Canada, it was just very tempting. And by the way, it still is in a few writings. I would not overstate this, maybe half a dozen 
districts, uh, political districts in British Columbia, on the west coast of Canada, and in Ontario, the largest province of Canada, central Canada. Uh, I, I, the, 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 it's still tempting to sing that song, or at least to look the other way, go along with it, say, you know, say the right thing, show up at the Gurdwara on Vaisakhi Day, and cheer as the floats go by with pictures of, Sikh, of gun-toting Sikh assassins, Sukhan Jinda, you know, the assassins of General Vaidya, the, the, the assassins of Indira Gandhi, and even, yes, of right. Singh Pama. They put his picture on the outside of a, of a, a very important Gurdwara in British Columbia to honor him as a great martyr of the Sikh nation. So uh, I, I don't I don't know enough about the case uh, in other countries, same to some extent in in Britain, uh, where I, I, right. I, have, I have interviewed uh, you know a, a British MP, for example, who was himself a Sikh, uh, absolutely baffled by you know he would raise his voice, he's saying, "Look, th this is getting out of hand." You know, like about tens of thousands of people are dying in this insurrection, and you're saying, "Oh, well, not our problem." You know, it is our problem. There are people being killed, and there have been important assassinations of critics of the separatist movement in London. Uh, so, I think, in general, the answer to your question is that the West has been uh, naive, blind, and soft in its treatment, and to some degree up to the point of embarrassment that continues. And by the point of embarrassment, I mentioned the, the Air India bombing. Let me also just mention briefly the 2018 visit to India of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, when it emerged, yes. oops, that uh, a convicted Khalistani terrorist had been invited yes. to a glittering reception for the Prime Minister at the High Commissioner's house in New Delhi. Uh, I mean, can you imagine I mean, how you know, opposing with the Prime Minister's wife? Well, that was a pretty yeah. picture, wasn't it? And and uh, so and then, of course, they pulled in their horns and uh, and kind of said, "Oh no, no, no! We support a united India. This was a mistake. He should, this guy should never have got an invitation, and so on." But fundamentally, I don't think that uh, 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 Canadian politicians of the left or the right or the centre have really got the message. They just try to get avoid Eric, getting Just a follow-up question here: You mentioned the Air India bombings. Now, uh, the Babar Khalsa, by and large, who uh, the members have been accused and uh, convicted of the bombings, they, by and large, are able to operate with impunity abroad. How is that possible? Uh, well, first, I, I, I'm often asked this, you know, why, why don't we kick them out of the country? Well, yes. they're Canadian citizens. You can't deport from Canada a Canadian citizen. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it can be done. Second of all, they're very careful not to break the law in Canada. The a, a, active Khalistanis now, they, they work through political action. They have freedom yes. of speech. I mean, the government, yeah. both the governments of Canada, both liberal and conservative, have always said from the outset, look, uh, we have separatists in Canada, in Quebec. They're allowed to speak, right. to organize, to lobby, to form political parties. What's wrong with that? And... Uh, mm. Okay. And, 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 and they're correct. Um, so that, that's fine. Uh, but the problem with the... Sorry, uh, just for, but they are not under suspicion. They are not viewed by the government uh, on any kind of list, etc. Well, they, 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 they were on a list uh, a couple of years ago when the government put out a, a public safety na national security report naming right. the continuing threat of Khalistani extremism. And there were right. howls of, of dismay from the Khalistani lobby saying, oh, there's no, there's no extremist here. You can't say that. This is terrible. And we're going to make trouble for your MPs come the next election. We're not going to give you those 10,000 votes we promised you um, if, unless you take that language out of the report. So they did. And the opposition wrote up a motion to tear this right. apart, to, to criticize the government for doing this and to condemn Khalistani extremism, to expose the government as, as having been too, too soft. And guess what? The lobby got into action again and went to work on the opposition. And they abandoned right. their motion. So both sides uh, caved in. Terry, I just want to bring you to, your prime uh, to the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. I mean, your report talks of a great security risk to Canada by very influential people. But here in India, we get the impression that Trudeau doesn't seem to care 
because as you yourself pointed out, in 2018, his visit, he turned up with a Khalistani. Has that attitude changed at all? Are, uh, are he and other Canadian politicians realizing the threat of this? Uh, yes, yes, they are, but let's not exaggerate what's happening in Canada. The, yeah. the, na the national security threat in, in, in Canada basically takes this form, the display in a place of honor of a big blow-up photo of Tovinda Singh Pama as a martyr of the Sikh nation, a great man, a hero, a model for Sikh children. Uh, that spits in the faces of the victim's families. It spits upon the findings of the criminal trial, which went on for four years, which was public and transparent and professional and credible and tested the evidence under oath in public. And furthermore, an additional four years of a judicial inquiry, which came to the same conclusion that Pama was indeed the mastermind, the author, the leader of the plot, against Air India. So uh, I, I personally uh, would say that that is a threat to us. Because if this kind of disinformation uh, right. is, is, is being marketed uh, to whole, a whole population, a whole new generation, uh, and, and I emphasize it's one Gurdwara, but it's a very influential Gurdwara. It's not a back street place. Uh, if that is continuing- but you are I, saying I, that. Does the prime minister feel that at all? Because well, we get the feeling that he doesn't. Uh, well, in India. Well, uh, the uh, former president of the World Sikh Organization, which is a separatist organization, uh, was uh, running the uh, campaign for the prime minister in British Columbia. Right. He's very, very, very helpful, very helpful man to the prime minister. So, you know, don't tell me the prime minister is crazy. If he, you know, he gets free help and he, uh, and he, he thinks he doesn't get his hands dirty. Well, the former president of the World Sikh Organizations, he's never committed any crime. So uh, what, what's your problem? And, and, and Canadians are not, you know, they're not into the detail of this. The, the Air India bombing was 35 years ago. Uh, and uh, and the, the Khalistanis will often say, if you challenge them, but what are you talking about? It's all over now. There hasn't been a, 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 a Khalistani terrorist attack uh, in, in many years, not since the assassination in British Columbia of Tara Singh Haya, uh, who was a, a witness uh, in the Air India trial who was killed before he could te testify, and the publisher of the Indo-Canadian Times, a newspaper, a Punjabi language newspaper in British Columbia, not since 1998, well, we haven't killed anyone lately, is what they're saying to us. So, so get get over it. You know, we're we're just doing lawful advocacy. Well, it's hey, lawful. that's a very good point to ask my next question to you. For someone who has followed the movement for so many years, how dangerous do you think the Khalistani movement, as well as in as well as the Pak separatist movement, how dangerous do you think it is for India at this point in time? And well, my follow-up well, question is. If it is very dangerous, what do you think that more do you think that India can do internally and on the global stage to convince other countries like Canada? Well, uh, I, I said I said earlier that I thought that the Khalistani movement was shooting itself in the foot by having this referendum. And the reason I said that was because they will expose right. their basic lie. The basic lie that the Khalistanis have been telling for some decades now is that they are the authentic voice of the Sikhs. They speak for the Sikhs. They, they always say, well, this, you know, we represent the Sikhs. Of course they don't. The vote for the only separatist party, party in the last Punjab elections, for example, uh, was 0.32%. One third of 1%, a microscopic fraction of the electorate voted for that, that splinter, the man, the man splinter group of the uh, Shiromani Akali Dal. Uh, so the, uh, I believe that the Khalistan movement ha has shot, shot itself in the foot by committing itself to hold a referendum, which will show what? Which will show that the tiny minority of people who, with, within the Sikh community who support a separate state, support a separate state. Well, that's not big news. That's not going to impress anyone at all. I mean, 90% of the world Sikhs still live in Punjab, and they vote for Captain Amarinda, a fierce yeah. anti-separatist. Uh, so, uh, but, but the second part 
of that answer is this. India has also shot itself in the foot. You asked what India could do uh, and how dangerous it is. Well, they just made it more dangerous. Here's how. India, by banning the referendum, by attacking their free speech, by refusing to recognize the referendum, and by criminalizing those who peacefully advocate the referendum, has handed a weapon to the Khalistanis. They can say, well, of course we got low numbers in the referendum because of Indian repression. And on we go and on again for another decade or two. And uh, India could have been more self-confident, I think. They could have looked at the election results the same way I did and said to themselves, look, we got nothing to fear here. It, it, we're a free country. We're a democracy, the world's greatest democracy, and we're going to uh, 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 let, let them campaign, let them fall on their faces in public, because I, I, I believe that's what they're going to do. I mean, Canada has the largest Sikh diaspora in the world. There are half a million Sikhs in, in, in Canada, and as I said, they're politically quite influential, because the riding, the districts where they hold sway, they're swing districts, and, and they can elections can turn on those writings in British Columbia and Ontario. But uh, I think it, India could have, uh, has, has in a sense, uh, I wouldn't overstate it, but they have made it more dangerous. But the bottom line is it's become less dangerous over the years as young Sikhs grow up and show less and less interest in the battles of the past. Terry, I'll just end with one more point to ponder. Um, Yes, what you're saying is the Khalistani movement may be dying out. That's true. I also want to ask you, you know, we have a Pakistani government under Imran Khan. Is the Imran Khan regime trying to support or push support for the Khalistani cause? We have seen Sikhs for Justice in Pakistani separate groups join hands at the UK High Commission. So is there a move by the, this uh, Pakistani regime to push this? Yes, that certainly is. Nothing's, nothing's going to change under Imran Khan. The traditional right. party, remember, it's low cost. You know, they're not, they're not committing an army to this. They're not spending a lot of money on this. It's self-financed by the Khalistanis as we, uh, in the West, by rich Khalistanis contributing money in, in London and New York and Toronto and Vancouver. Uh, so it's not costing them a lot of money, and I believe that nothing will change under Imran Khan. It's an easy, low-cost way to bleed India, and 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 uh, and that there's no reason for them to change. Uh, and and by the way, you mentioned the the joining of hands um, between the Pakistanis and Sikhs uh, in London. Same happened here in my my hometown of Ottawa. Uh, a bus arrives, and it's full of. Uh, uh, Khalistanis on the one hand, Pakistanis on the other. Pakistanis have their demonstration and the Khalistanis have their demonstration. Then the Pakistanis tweet pictures of their half of the demonstration, but cut out the Khalistanis. <laughs> so you never know they were even there. And of course, the other side does the same thing. So it, it, it's, it, it's not a perfect marriage uh, between the two. Because let's face it, the Khalistanis know perfectly well why the Pakistanis support them, as we said earlier, for their own purposes, not because they love the Sikhs that they're currently driving out of Pakistan. Terry, okay, thank you so much for talking to us. And um, hopefully we'll be back to talk to you more about the Khalistan doors. Amashwin yeah. Amman, thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you.